Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the program today, we update an old segment and present a brand new one. We have a detective story starring Richard Diamond, who's tracking a Bigfoot. Also, how about a short story where a shipwrecked alien waits for rescue? All that and more awaits you on this episode of the RAS. So, let's jump right in with the always fresh and newly updated What's That You Say? What's That You Say? I say... Thank you to Stuart Colburn for the new and improved bumper for this segment. I put out a request on freesound.org for a voiceover and Stuart came through. Thank you, Stuart. As we approach the new year, I wanted to take a breath and close out some of the things that I think are newsworthy stuff. Not to be confused with stuff you need to know or stuff that just doesn't matter. With this criteria in mind, let's get going on these important, or maybe not important, items. YouTube arrives. With the help of my service provider, Libsyn, and jumping through a couple hoops, Ron's Amazing Stories is now part of the YouTube family. This really is an experiment to see how well the show performs there. I'm kind of hoping to create a whole new audience. If you spend a lot of time watching those videos and really want to help the show out, take a minute and subscribe to our brand new Ron's Amazing Stories channel. The easiest way to get there is to go to YouTube and search for the show. Horror Horror Express Express gets gets a makeover. makeover. I took some time last week and updated the Horror Express homepage. You will now see all of the shows we've done so far and can stream and download them right there. Also, there is a contact form specifically for the Horror Express so you can send comments and questions directly to Jason and I. That podcast is becoming more popular all the time and Jason and I want to thank you for the love. On a side note, we're heading into the studio later this week for... H.E. number 13. The subject will be Vampires Revisited and has a special guest expert, Douglas Robinson. The The SoundCloud SoundCloud numbers. numbers. Did you know that the show could be heard on SoundCloud? Not too many people are doing so. Since there is a monthly fee associated with this service, and I believe I've given it a good go, I'm dropping my support from it. It will roll back to their free service, which allows for only three hours of content. That means I have to delete something each week. If you're interested in saving or paying for this service, please let me know and we can make arrangements for that. Otherwise, how can you help? The RAS. With that last bit in mind, if you want to help the show stay strong, healthy, and free, there are things that you can do. First, tell your friends about us. I believe that if you like the show, your friends probably will too. Second, leave reviews about us. iTunes is the best place because they account for about 75% of the show's subscribers. To leave a comment in iTunes does require an Apple ID. If you listen to the show on any of the other spots, many of them don't allow comments. You gain on these sites by increasing your followers. So, be sure to click that subscribe or follow button. Thank you so much for helping out. Your Your stories. Stories Finally, another thing I personally want from you guys are your stories. Remember, the stories can be about anything. We've had funny, scary, paranormal, emotional, adventurous, and even downright amazing tales. So take a minute and write them up. And if you don't want to write them yourself, contact me and I'll do it for you. Or we can have you come on the show and tell it in your own words. 
Whatever it takes, I want your stories. Thank you guys for all of your support. It really does mean the world to me. And now for our OTR story. Our OTR story comes from the world of the gumshoe. In 1945, Dick Powell portrayed Philip Marlowe in the movie Murder, My Sweet. This was a radical departure in character for Mr. Powell from a Hollywood song and dance man to a hard-boiled detective. On June 11, 1945, the Lux Radio Theater brought Murder, My Sweet to the radio again with Dick Powell in the lead. These two performances prompted his selection for the part of Richard Diamond some four years later. Richard Diamond, private detective, came to NBC in 1949. Diamond was a slick, sophisticated detective with a sharp tongue for the folks that needed it. The scripts for the show were masterful and so creative. Why wouldn't they be? They were written by one of the greatest scriptwriters ever, Mr. Blake Edwards. Now you say you don't know that name? Ever heard of The Pink Panther? Our story is called, strangely enough, The Bigfoot Crafton Case, and it first aired on August 30th, 1950. Listen, while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist with a welcome from the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Rexall mineral oil, for example. This is the mineral oil specially refined for extra heavy body. What's more, Rexall mineral oil is tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-irritating, and non-habit forming. Quality like that is what we family druggists are talking about when we tell you you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Uh, just a moment. Diamond. Diamond. Diamond, pick up the receiver and speak to me or I'll, 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 I'll... Walt, Walt, is that your blood pressure I hear bubbling or are you calling from Niagara Falls? What's the big idea keeping me waiting like that? Well, the big idea is that it's a beautiful day and I'm happy. When I'm happy, I whistle. And when I'm happy and whistling, I don't like to be interrupted. I'll remember that the next time you're unhappy and you ask a favor from me. You can whistle then, too. Oh, the great, big, important police lieutenant wants a favor from poor little old Richard Diamond. I want you to go to a funeral. Yours? No, it's mine. <laughs> Say, I'll live to dance to Charleston on your grave, wise guy. Now, they're burying Bigfoot Grafton this afternoon. How do you know? How do I know? How do I know what? That it's Bigfoot Grafton they're tucking in. The way it read in my paper, the Harbor Patrol fished out a guy presumed to be Bigfoot Grafton, boy racketeer. We're satisfied with the identification. Huh? Fingerprints? Fingerprints. Look, the body was in the Hudson River for nearly a week. Oh. Then tell me, what makes you so sure the guy they're putting in the ground today is Grafton? Look, Diamond, you're beginning to exasperate me. Will you or won't you go with us to Bigfoot Grafton's funeral this afternoon? Why me? Maybe you can show the boys how to dig the grave. Oh, Walt, Walt, that's silly. I don't know, a grave from a hole in the ground. So why me? 
Because you once told me about a little business matter you had with some of Grafton's gang out west. And because some of those same hoods may attend the funeral. And because if any of them do, you'll recognize them. And I can point them out to you. Say, you are a detective. Otis and I'll pick you up in about an hour. Goodbye, Diamond. Goodbye, Bright Eyes. Come on, Billy. How many times have I got to tell you this is the only thing left to do? It's all wrong, Marge. I'll tell you there's no need to call in a private eye. Well, hello, girl. Who are you? The name's on the door. Your diamond? Ah. Uh, you see something you don't like? Yeah, you. Oh, you'll never be lovely, be engaged, or get to use pawns with an attitude like that. It's a waste of time, Marge, a waste of time. Lay off it, Billy. I know what's right. We came a long way to see you, diamond. All the way from West Frampton we came. We're ducklings. Well, first impressions are so deceiving. I almost thought you were girls. Now, look, there's a psychiatrist just down the hall who... Get I'm... this, Billy. The guy thinks we're nuts. Well, maybe you are a couple of ducks, and I'm the one who's crazy. Not ducks. Ducklings. Oh. Well, then if you have that kind of a problem, go to the Audubon Society. You never heard of the Long Island Ducklings? All we done was win the pennant last year. Pennant? Oh, baseball? Now it's coming. We're a girls' softball team. We got our own park out in West Frampton. I play third base. Who's on first? Me. Come on, let's get out of here, Marge. We'll stay. We gotta find Lottie, and he's gotta help us. Lottie? Lottie Wyracek, our second baseman. She's been missing almost a week now. We can't win without our second baseman. Oh, yes. I can see where it must leave quite a gap between first base and shortstop. We ain't gonna win the pennant again unless we get Lottie back, Diamond. We gotta have her. You're Elected? Elected? I'm not even sure I accept the nomination. See, let's go, Marge. You don't want the job, Diamond? Well, I've never looked for a missing second baseman before. I wouldn't know where to begin. A fine detective. Here, you, you begin by looking at her snapshot. Oh, no, no, girls. Really, I'm terribly busy right now. I've got to go to a funeral and help the police department look with it. Look at her picture. But I tell you, I... 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 I, I don't tell me this is... Lottie Wirechick. You mean a girl who looks like this wastes her nights playing second base? Yeah. Wastes, he says. Diamond, stop drooling. You take the job? Well, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted, yes. I'm, I'm very tempted. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's get some answers first. Well, ask Billy. She's a roommate. All right. Now, think back, Billy, to a day or so before she disappeared. Uh, she seemed worried about anything? Nervous? Upset? No. Why, she even hit two home runs the very last night she played. She did, huh? Oh. Well. I wonder if... Oh, no, no, that isn't possible. The Dodgers do a lot of things, but they wouldn't kidnap people. You say she's been with the team two years? Yeah. Diamond, what sort of questions are these? Please, Lefty. It's my turn at bat. Now, Billy, what did she do before she became a second baseman? Who knows? You'll find her for us? For you? <laughs> oh, no. For me. They gave me a pass for the game that night with the Amagants at Amazons, informed me how to get out to West Frampton the quickest way as the E-train flies, then exploded themselves out, leaving me with a snapshot of a second baseman who looked like Jane Russell, only more so. I wasn't able to dream too long because soon the door opened and I looked up to find the most beautiful gabardine suit I'd ever seen walking toward my desk on the frame of the ugliest hoodlum I'd ever seen. Hey, you diamond? To some people... To others, I'm Mr. Diamond. Uh, Diamond. Mr. Diamond. The late Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the one I like the best. All right, parrot puss. Who's been eating your crackers? All right, comic. I'm just a boy with a message. Well, spill it. You had visitors, huh? Yeah? Yeah. A couple of overgrown tomatoes. A couple of tomatoes that look more like they belong to the Russian infantry than to the human race. Well, you're not very much to look at yourself, ugly. Get on with the message. The message is lay off. Don't go looking for no missing girl. You don't wake up with no bullet holes where your eyes ought to be. Huh? That's the message. The whole message. No signature? You don't need no signature, friend. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, uh just a minute, repulsive. Yeah? I want to tell you about the last side of the mouth punk who brought me a message like this without a signature. Go on. Frighten me. Go on. He just stand back, that diamond. Don't come no closer. I'll let you... Don't reach into that pocket, punk. Oh, my arm. Now, let me get it for you. Ah, a luger. And almost as ugly as you are. We won't be needing it for this game. My arm. My arm. Oh, there's your arm. Now, put it up with the other one and I'll knock your head off. 
few seconds later when I picked myself up off the floor. I looked around for my spar mate, but he'd taken his arms and gone home. Leaving me with an eye which for weeks to come would have me lying to people about walking into a door. Yeah, a door wearing gabardine. How'd you get that shiner, Diamond? I walked into a door, Walt. A door with a fist at the end of it. Where is this cemetery? South Carolina? We'll be there soon. Bigfoot Grafton won't mind waiting a little longer. Assuming, Sergeant Otis, that it is Bigfoot Grafton they're planting. Oh, no, you're not going to start that again. I told you on the phone. We're satisfied with the identification. What identification? Laundry marks and Grafton shirt. Cleaning marks and Grafton suit. Go on. What do you mean, go on? Look, Walt, suppose you're wanted for murder... Two murder raps, and you don't have a chance of beating. And suppose that next to the mailman with the income tax refund, you're the most looked for guy in the country. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're going to say, Diamond. You think maybe Grafton finds a sucker with his same general build, shoots him in the spine, changes clothes with him, and then dumps him in the big bathtub. That's right, Walt. Well, us silly, confused, homicide cops figured that way, too. Until we checked up on what gave Grafton his nickname. His nickname? Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. Fourteen and a half. We found his shoemaker. He verified the size. So? So it's possible that Grafton can find a guy that fits his general physique. It's even possible that the guy he finds not only is built the same way body-wise, but wears exactly size fourteen and a half Brogan's, too. Yeah, it's possible. But highly improbable. Yeah, maybe you're right at that. Well, on behalf of myself and all the other simple-minded fellas known as cops... Thank you, Diamond, for saying what you just did. Thank you. There's the cemetery. It was just a simple little funeral. Except that the coffin cost maybe $10,000 more than mine will ever cost. And excluding the fact that there were enough flowers to make a couple of dozen floats for the turnip of roses parade. Yes, it was just a simple little funeral with maybe a thousand simple little mourners. Good conservative people like safe blowers, burglars, con men, petty thieves, and some not so petty. Big wheels, little wheels, chiselers, grifters, grafters, jip artists. Well, Diamond, you see anyone who used to run with Grafton's mom? No, not yet. Hey, now look. Now, what's he doing here? Oh. The parrot nose in the stylish gabardine suit. I've been admiring that suit. Gabardine, huh? Too bad a poor little gabardine had to go give up its life just so a mug like that could have a suit. Where are you going, Diamond? Who is that guy? He's a messenger boy. I'll be right back. I edged my way through the crowd toward him, hoping that in view of the solemnity of the occasion, none of the pickpockets among the mourners would make use of the opportunity to swipe my suspenders. Five yards away, he turned. He saw me and started to run. I put my head down like a sprinter and turned to follow. There's nothing like a merry chase in a merry place like a cemetery. And just when I thought I had him... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Diamond! Diamond, what are you doing running into tombstones? Oh, well, I suddenly remembered it's been years since I had a collision with a tombstone. Oh, what were you chasing that guy with a fancy suit for? I wanted to find out who his tailor is. Look, uh, Otis got a good look at that twerp I was chasing. Tell him to go through Rogue's Gallery and try to identify him for me, huh? Yeah, but where are you going? Me? No, I think I'll go to a ball game. It was a good game as games go, fast and exciting, and my girls did themselves proud, 8-3. Even though the girl who was playing second in place of the missing Lottie made three errors. After the game, I was in the corridor outside the dressing room talking to Billy, the first baseman. The one who didn't think I should have been hired to bird dog the missing girl. Look, Diamond, this is all for nothing. Lottie ain't missing. We never called on you. There's no case. Now, that's the same tune with a slightly different lyric and ugly in a gabardine suit sang to me. It's a good thing I'm stubborn. It's a bad thing, Diamond, for you. It's going to maybe cost you your life. No. No! Don't! It happened that fast. By the time I turned around to see who did the shooting, he had disappeared in the crowd. Dirty heel. Diamond, what happened? I heard shooting. Stand back, everybody. Send for a doctor. Oh, my God. He rotten heel. I was on his team. Who, Billy? Who? I told him, Marge, called on you to find Lottie. Who, dear? They'll kill Lottie. They'll kill Lottie. Billy. Uh, uh, Billy. 
diamond. Is she? Is she? If anyone asks you who's on first, the answer is no one. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. I've discovered lately that a lot of people think they don't need to take any precautions against vitamin deficiency during the summer months. But the truth is, we're just as apt to be low on vitamins during the summer as any other season. Then you think people should continue right through the summer taking a vitamin supplement? Indeed I do, ma'am. And the one I recommend is Rexall Plenamins. Why exactly? Well, just two plenamin capsules a day give you more than your minimum daily requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron, plus other beneficial factors of the vitamin B complex. Say, with all that, they must be expensive. On the contrary, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at any Rexall drugstore. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name... Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond, this department isn't in operation so that you can find girls. I don't care how she looks in her baseball uniform. Oh, but this is business, Walt. I tell you, she's been kidnapped. Another girl on the team was just murdered. Another murder? Where? West Frampton. West who? Frampton, out on Long Island. City limits? No. Uh, That's the quickest case I ever marked closed. What do you want to waste my time with imported homicides for? Don't I have enough to do right here? Oh, but Vaughn... Don't butt me. They've been knocking each other off like flies this week. We're so jammed up, I got three stiffs that don't even have a place to lie down. Four, if you include Otis. Oh, just for that wise guy, I ain't talking. Oh, if I could only be sure of that. I mean, I ain't talking about the guy you played tag with in the cemetery. I found him in the picture book, all right, Diamond. It took me two hours. And just for making cracks at me, I ain't telling you his name. Whose name? Joe Gabardine's, that's whose. And I ain't telling you what else I found out about him in the picture book either. Why not? Because you think you're smarter than the whole police department put together. That's why not. Oh. And so if I go spill to you that this Joe Gabardine used to work as a gunsel for the late Bigfoot Grafton, you're going to right away say Bigfoot Grafton ain't dead after all. And that I'm a dope. Walt, you hear that? The guy that threatened me if I went looking for Lottie Wirecheck, this Joe Gabardine, is one of Grafton's boys. Say, who told you? Was one of Grafton's boys. Grafton's dead. No, but maybe not. Maybe all these shenanigans are part of Grafton's plot to put some sucker in his coffin and stay undercover. Sure, sure. Maybe Lottie Wirecheck knew in some way or other that the guy they fished out of the river and buried today wasn't Grafton. Look, Walt, you got a... Uh, 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 Diamond, tell me. Uh, that name you said, the, the one that sounds like something spelled backwards. Wirecheck? That's funny. What's funny? That's the same name as this dame's in the file missing person sent over. Only this one's name is Lottie Wirechek. So's this one, you dope. You mean there's two dames with a name like that? Yeah, just like there are two heads on a sergeant named Otis Loveloon. Now, listen here. Who reported her missing? Just for being a fresh guy, I ain't gonna tell you. You ain't gonna tell him what? That it says here on the file card that this doctor reported her missing. Who said anything about a doctor? Huh? You sick, Otis? You need a doctor? I ain't sick. Besides, he ain't that kind of doctor. He's a dentist. Who's a dentist? This Dr. Alman. Dr. Percy Alman. 223 Park Avenue. So? What do you mean, so? What about him? What do you mean, what about him? Well, you brought him into the conversation. Dr. Percy Alman. You said 223 Park Avenue. What made you mention him if you don't have anything to say about him? He's the guy who reported this laddie watchamacheck missing you, dope. Gee, Diamond, are you dumb? Dr. Percy Alvin's home for decrepit teeth at 223 Park Avenue was a fancy schmancy establishment where bad little molars and becuspids went in for punishment. I could tell even before I met Alman that he was the kind of drill artist who assured the customers there'd be no pain. 
No pain at all, and there usually wasn't. Until the customers got their bills. The office was a ground floor professional suite that opened directly on the street, and when I pushed open the door and went in, this kind of nice middle-aged guy greeted me with, Yes? I'm uh, looking for Dr. Alman. I'm Dr. Alman, but it's after my office hours, young man, unless it's an emergency. Well, it's, uh, it's about Lottie. Lottie Wirecheck. Lottie? You're from the police. You found her. Well, not yet, no. And I'm not from the police. Not the... Who are you? My name is Diamond. I'm a private investigator. Oh. <laughs> you gave me quite a turn for a moment. Well, I'm sorry. Doctor, I'd like you to tell me a few things. What sort of things? Lottie Wirecheck. What's she to you? Oh, presently, just a friend. Uh, formerly, the best dental assistant I ever had. An extremely nice girl. Yeah, yes, I, uh, I saw her snapshot. A dental assistant, huh? Yeah, lovely, lovely girl. Um, I hated to lose her. But this baseball thing had been burning in her for a long time. Look, Diamond, just how much do you know about all this? Oh, I know that Lottie's missing. Maybe in trouble. Well, uh, I do need help. And perhaps I'd better tell you everything. I'm game. But I think I should warn you, the information I'm going to give you is dangerous. It may mean your life. Well, I'm uh, still game. Maybe not as much as a few seconds ago, but... Very well. A year or so ago, I had a patient, a man who called himself Dunn, George Dunn. And then you found out that Dunn wasn't Dunn at all, that he had very big feet and he was a racketeer named Grafton. Yes, you were very clever, Diamond. It was a gentle chart he wanted. He threatened me. I felt that if I ever gave it to him, he'd feel the necessity for, uh, for killing me. So I gave the chart to Lottie to keep him here. It happened so fast, I barely had time to leap behind the chair. One second, the doctor and I were talking. The next, everything was bedlam and confusion. And blood and death and anger. My anger. The doctor had caught one smack between the eyes. And I got mad, shooting mad. I charged out of that office, maybe ten seconds behind the killer, just in time to see him get into a car and melt away into the traffic. He headed east, then south, and east again. Then stopped at a crummy-looking building and went in. And that's when smart, shrewd, clever private detective Diamond climbed a drain pipe, tore his pants, looked inside a second floor window, saw a girl tied to a chair, and like Lockenbar, broke in to rescue the fair second baseman in distress. Lottie? Look out! Oh, oh, this was getting monotonous. The billy caught me on the back of the neck, and while it didn't knock me out, it didn't make me feel like dancing either. The first thing I was aware of when I oriented myself to my new condition was the biggest pair of feet I'd ever seen. And the next thing I saw was the gabardine suit containing in its bright, clean folds the filthiest little murder artist I'd ever seen. So I made like a possum and pretended I was asleep. So, say, Grafton, I told you the shamus followed me. I want him. He's all yours, Joe, I promise, but later. Why later? Why wait? Because I gotta get that dental chart, that's why. Now that you've rubbed off the dentist and that goofy Billy the ball player, that chart's the only thing in the world that can prove Bigfoot Grafton's still alive. So why does that have to hold up Diamond's execution? Because maybe he knows where the dental chart's hid. I'm giving up on the dame here. She'd have told us long ago if she knew. If Diamond knows, he'll talk. Even if he don't know, he'll talk. And scream, too. Later, Joe. Now put that pig sticker back in your pocket. I don't hear you, Grafton. This Diamond made me unhappy, and I don't like to wait. I said put that knife away, Joe. I still don't hear you. All right, Joe. I I knew this was the only chance I'd get. They were too busy showing each other their fangs to give me their undivided attention. And so the possum stopped playing possum and made a stab at playing tiger. The act started with a well-aimed kick to what the fight reporters call the midsection. (laughs) And the gabardine suit folded limply and sagged to the floor like it didn't even have man inside it. And that's when Grafton pulled the gun, and that's when I made a grab for his knee. And you guessed it, there was a shot. And then there was a punch that made a mess out of a jawbone. And I'm happy to report that this time it wasn't mine. Oh, you're wonderful. What's your name? Well, honey, my name's Diamond. Diamond? Yes, dear, and believe me, a diamond is a girl's best friend. I had
hadn't anyone till you. I was a lonely one till you. I used to lie awake and wonder if there could be a someone in the wide world just made for me. Now I see I had to save my love for you. I never gave my love till you. And through my lonely heart demanding it, Cupid took a hand in it. I hadn't any war till you. You're so romantic, even with a black eye. Oh. Oh, Ricky, darling, it must have been dreadful. Oh, it uh, it had its moments, Helen. Yes, I saw that photograph. The second baseman. What's the matter with the second baseman? Well, Ricky, if she were any good, wouldn't she be a first baseman? Honey, honey, I don't think you understand too much about baseball. Teach me. Oh, it takes years, baby, years. Well. Hmm? Well, uh, well, baseball's a game that's uh, that's, uh, divided into innings. Nine innings. Inning? What's an inning? Maybe I better teach you how to play post office. No, no. Ricky, please. Well, uh, uh, let's see now. An inning is a, a sort of a division, a, a stanza, a, a, a frame. Yeah, that's right, a frame. A frame? An inning's a frame? Yeah, hey, you're digging it. No, I'm not, Ricky, not really. Maybe we'd better forget it. All right, all right. And... Inning is a frame. That's right, dear. And inning is a frame. Mm. Ricky, was she nice? Lottie? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this for her. She sure had a beautiful inning. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Don't wait until you're already suffering from acid stomach and then wish you had Bismarex on hand. Buy a bottle tomorrow. This famous Rexall antacid often neutralizes excess acidity within one minute. More than that, Bismarex gives relief that's continuous and prolonged because its scientifically balanced ingredients work in sequence, easing gastric distress and leaving a soothing protective covering on irritated stomach membranes. Ask your Rexall druggist for Bismarex. He'll tell you, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Michael Camroy with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, John Daner, Bill Conrad, Virginia Gregg, Gloria Blondell, and Sidney Miller. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. 
Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Some final thoughts on this one. The plot theme remained fairly consistent throughout the entire run of the show. Diamond gets beat up, solves a tough murder case with the support of the police department. Remarkably, for all the gunfights, Diamond never got shot. And for all his bravado, he had a serious case of vertigo. That I can relate to. Simple thoughts about a simple case, and now this. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have Say Hello For Me by Frank W. Coggins, and it is read by Miss Emily Burke. Say Hello For Me, by Frank W. Coggins. This was to be THE day, but of course, Professor Pettibone had no way of knowing it. He arose, as he had been doing for the previous twenty years, donned the tattered remnants of his spacesuit, and went out into the open. He stood erect, bronzed, magnificent, faced distant earth, and recited, "'Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here.' You make the world happy and bring us good cheer. It was something he had heard as a child, and, isolated here on Mars, he had remembered it and used it to keep from losing his power of speech. The ritual finished, he walked to the end of the nearest canal and gathered a bushel or so of dried Martian moss. He returned and began polishing the shiny exterior of the wrecked spaceship. It had to really glitter if it was to be an effective beacon in guiding the rescue ship. Professor Pettibone knew, had known for years, that a ship would come. It was just a matter of time, and as the years slipped by, his face diminished not a whit. With his task half completed, he glanced up at the sun and quickened the polishing. It was a long walk to the place the berry bushes grew, and if he arrived too late, the sun would have dried out the night's crop of fragile berries, and he would wait until the morrow for nourishment. But on this day he was fated to arrive at the bush area not at all, because an alien sound from above again drew the professor's eyes from his work, and he knew that that the day had arrived. The ship was three times as large as any he had ever visualized, and its futuristic design told him, sharply, how far he had fallen behind in his dreaming. He smiled and said, quite calmly, I dare say I am about to be rescued. And he experienced a thrill as the great ship set down and two men emerged therefrom. A thrill tinged with a guilt sense, because emotional experiences were rare in an isolated life and seemed somehow indecent. The two men held weapons. They advanced upon Professor Pettibone, looked up into his face, reflected a certain wary hostility. That the hostility was tinged with instinctive respect, even awe, made it no less potent. One of them asked, Fella, man came in ship, sky boat, long time ago. Him dead? Where? Appropriate gestures accompanied the words. Professor Pettivone smiled down at the little men and bowed. Of course you are referring to me. I came in the ship. I am Professor Pettibone. It was nice of you to hunt me up. The eyes of the two Terran spacemen met and locked in startled inquiry. One of them voiced the reaction of both when he said, What the hell? You no doubt are curious as to the fate of the other members of the expedition. They were killed, all save Fletcher, who lasted a week. Professor Pettibone waved a hand. There, in the graveyard. But their eyes remained on the only survivor of that ill-fated first expedition. It was hard to accept him as the man they sought, but, 
Faced with undeniable similarity between what they expected and what they had found, the two spacemen had no alternative. "'I hope your food supply is ample, and varied,' Professor Pettibone said. This seemed to bring them out of their bemusement. "'Of course, Professor. Would you care to come aboard?' The other made a try at congenial levity. "'You must be pretty hungry after twenty years.' "'Really? Has it been that long? I tried to keep track at first. "'We can blast off any time you say. You're probably pretty anxious to get back.' "'Indeed I am. The changes in twenty years must be breathtaking.' I wonder if they'll remember me. A short time later, the professor said, It's amazing. A ship of this size handled by only two men. Then he sat down to a repast laid out by one of the odd spacemen. But, after nibbling a bit of this, a forkful of that, he found that satisfaction lay in the anticipation more so than in the eating. We'll look around and see what we can find in the way of clothing for you, professor, said one of the spacemen. Then the man's bemusement returned. His eyes traveled over the magnificent physique before him. The perfect giant of a man. The great Apollo-like head with the calm, clear eyes. The expression of complete contentment and serenity. The spaceman said, Professor, to what do you attribute the changes in your body? What is there about this planet? I really don't know, Professor Pettibone looked down at his torso with an impersonal eye. I think the greenish skin pigmentation is a result of the mineral-heavy vapors that occur during certain seasons. The growth. As to my body, I really don't know. But the two spacemen, though they didn't refer to it, were not concerned with the body so much as the aura of completeness, the radiation of contentment, which came from somewhere within and it was passing strange that nothing more was said about the professor returning to earth. No great revelation suddenly arrived at that he would not go. Rather, they discussed various things that three gentlemen meeting casually would discuss. Then Professor Pettibone arose from his chair and said, It was kind of you to drop off and see me. And one of the spacemen replied, A pleasure, sir, a real pleasure indeed. Then the professor left the ship and watched it lift up on a tail of red fire and go away. He raised an arm and waved. "'Say hello for me,' he called. Then he turned away and, from force of habit, he began again to polish the hull, knowing that he would keep it shining and be proud of it for many years to come. Almost beyond reach of the planet, one of the spacemen flipped a switch and put a certain sensitive communication mechanisms to work, so sensitive they could pick up etheric vibrations far away and make them audible. But only faintly came the pleasant voice of a contented man. Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here. You make the world. End of Say Hello For Me by Frank W. Coggins One thing I like about this podcast is the stuff that I learn from it. Sometimes, however, there is nothing to learn, or perhaps there is something hidden that prevents me from knowing the truth. The author of our story is an unknown. One trail leads to a man that wrote self-home maintenance books in the 70s and 80s, but I doubt very much that he wrote today's story. More likely, this story was sent in to the pulp mags in the 1950s anonymously. That was pretty standard those days because the authors who wrote for those rags were considered trash authors. Guys who couldn't make it in the real publication syndicates. It's too bad too because I think this one is a pretty good one and it is definitely thought provoking. I hope that you enjoyed it. And now a new segment to Ron's Amazing Stories. Public Domain is a brand new segment for the show. 
what we'll do with this is present unique things that I find or you, the listener, tell me about. The trick is, is that it has to be in the public domain or Creative Commons. To open this new project, I found a band that never met each other, but yet have produced their first album called, strangely enough, Public Domain. Triad, probably one of the first internationally separated internet creative common bands, have released their first album called Public Domain. The members of Triad are Arna, Emma, John Hollowatch, R.J. Marshall, and Ververac. They met through the internet after Hollowatch remixed Marshall's work, and then Verovac added the vocals. Over the many months that followed that, they collaborated all without having ever spoken a single word to each other, only emailed. The result? They produced a strikingly original work, combining elements of tri-hop, Alt rock, classical instrumentation, and electronica. Public domain breaks the mold of what you'd expect. Brilliant vocal work highlights the already excellent production of the tracks. And this is most predominantly displayed on the epic song Witness. Here is that song completely free and in the public domain.
that you enjoyed today's podcast. I'm sure Richard Diamond loved it. I do have bad news. Next week, there will not be a new podcast or blog. I'm taking the week off to reflect on my thankfulness. Not to worry, though. There will be a podcast replay sent out on Thursday for your enjoyment. And remember, I always pick the good ones. If you want to keep up with what's happening on Ron's Amazing Stories, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or sign up for the weekly newsletter. All of the links you'll need and access to the blog can be found at ronsamazingstories.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.